that first you have to concentrate your resources and you you have to focus and not diversify. Diversification under a hundred thousand dollars in net worth guarantees you a slow path to FI. So it's scary as hell, but you have to do that at the very beginning of your journey. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. What's up, everybody? It's your host, Bradley Labrie, and today I want to talk about the podcast sponsor, Rentometer. Whether you already have an established rental business or analyzing your first rental deal, you know that getting the rent right is crucial to lowering investment risk and optimizing your rental income. That's why the go-to source for rent data is Rentometer. Property investors and property managers rely on Rentometer because it is the fastest and easiest way to access quality rent data for addresses and neighborhoods anywhere in the United States. You can also research current, local comps, trends, and property data. Don't take our word for it. Rentometer analyzes over 500,000 rents per month and gets rave reviews from customers. My property manager, myself, and my clients all use Rentometer anytime we are looking to purchase a new property to know exactly what we can get for our properties. Go to Rentometer.com today to get your seven-day free trial and save up to 60%. Grow your rental business smarter with Rentometer. What's up, everybody? Real quick before we start the show. If you go down to the description or the show notes for this podcast episode, there's a link and that's going to send you to a page that you can download our free ebook on. This ebook is really good. Brad wrote it and it covers everything that you need to know about house hacking in a very structured order so you can put all the pieces together. All right, enjoy the show. Welcome to House Hacking Success. Today we got Scott Trench on the show, CEO of Bigger Pockets. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Thanks for having me, Drew. Scott, we brought you on the show because you got a couple of house hacks in your background and we look up to you. We love your book, uh, Set for Life. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm the CEO of Bigger Pockets. I am uh, married to a wonderful woman. I enjoy Denver, Colorado, and all the activities we have around here, like the outdoors rugby, a little bit of gaming, and spend most of my time kind of working towards our mission here at Bigger Pockets, which is helping people become financially free through real estate investing. Very cool. And Bigger Pockets, you know, it's had a huge influence on me. I think anyone who ever goes to look into real estate investing always comes across Bigger Pockets and we appreciate all the work you do there. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's just wonderful to, to see the impact that Bigger Pockets has had. I never would have thought we'd be like we are right now, this big and, and this, I guess, influential to some degree when, when I joined seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So you've done a few house hacks and uh, obviously we're a show about house hacking and trying to spread the word. Could you go a little bit, you know, back to when you started? Did you start with a house hack? or did you start investing in another way? Yeah. So my investing journey begins right out of college. Three months out of college, I joined a Fortune 500 company and didn't like the prospects of that. So I was like, hey, you know, if I work really hard, I'll go from financial analyst one to financial analyst two to senior financial analyst to the direct, you know, manager of finance to senior manager of finance to director, senior director, all the way up to CFO if things go really well. And quickly became interested in the concept of financial independence right away, you know, within the first three months of starting my career. So August 2013, I start my career and I become really obsessed with this concept of financial independence during that period. I couldn't tell you where it began, but I kind of settled into two different blogs or websites or communities, right? One was Mr. Money Mustache and the Mustache. Yeah, he's, awesome. he's, he's all about uh, frugality, financial freedom through frugality. And then the other one was Bigger Pockets. It allows you to save more, which means you have more to invest. And it means that you need less passive income to become financially independent. So there's a lot of really good math behind the idea of frugality or living financial freedom through badassity, as Mr. Money Mustache would say. But, you know, a big part of that, you know, the frugal, live frugally and save financial independence community is this idea of investing in index funds. And investing in index funds is very slow. So even with a, a 50% savings rate, you're retiring in 17 years, which is which is a lot, a long time or it seemed like a long time to me at the time in 2013. So I thought, can I combine that mentality with this concept of real estate investing? And because I thought I could get better returns. And I think a light bulb moment for me, you know, all of this is a light bulb moment, right? As you're kind of going down the rabbit hole of FI and all that kind of stuff and, and learning about what's possible uh, and passive income and all that kind of good stuff. A light bulb moment for me was an article I read on Bigger Pockets by, by Brandon Turner called How to Hack Your Housing and Get Paid to Live for Free, where he describes living in a quadplex and the benefits of that. It's stuff I'm sure that everyone who's listening to a house hacking podcast is familiar with. But at the time, 
find that was revolutionary. I think that's where the term house hacking can be traced back to is, is potentially that article. And I became like, that has so many obvious benefits. The ROI is astronomical, as I'm sure we've discussed on the show here in the past. And more importantly, if you're coupling it with a Mr. Money Mustache mentality, it reduces my living expenses to a large degree, which again, decreases the, uh, the threshold, the minimum threshold I need to attain FI. Because you know, if, I'm, if I go from spending 2000 a month, which includes my rent, to not paying rent anymore, now my threshold for FI is come down to 1500 a month, which is a very easy, relatively speaking, level of passive cash flow to attain. That was kind of the mentality behind that. Over the course of 2014, I early 2014, I drove for Uber, I tutored, I tried to start a couple of little side businesses that lost a little bit of money. But between that and my job, and I, I participated in the ESPP at my job and all that kind of stuff, I was able to, on a $48,000 a year salary, accumulate about $15,000 by July of 2014 and about twenty twenty two thousand dollars $22,000 by November of 2014. In July of 2014, I um, actually through networking with local real estate investors, met the founder of Bigger Pockets, Josh Dorkin, and joined Bigger Pockets as the third employee. And at the same time, I was shopping for duplexes. And around that same time, maybe like a month or two later, I went under contract to my first duplex. I got that duplex because prior to joining Bigger Pockets, I had posted in the forums, hey, I'm a newbie in Denver, Colorado, looking to buy my first duplex house hack, yada, yada. And an agent reached out to me. And I thought this was the coolest thing ever. I didn't realize that the agent just wanted, you know, was hoping for some business. But she ended up being great and brought me a duplex a few months later um, that met all of my criteria. And this duplex was a side-by-side, flat-roof duplex. Dumpy little building, terrible yard full of weeds, worst house in the block. I think I later found out that there might have been a murder or a shooting on the, on the property in yeah. prior years before then or whatever. But I got the place for $240,000. And at the time in, in Denver, no, no one will understand this now. You can't relate because the market had been going up for six years and everything was overinflated. And everyone was talking about how the Denver market was about to crash because prices were going through the roof and how insane it was and what a buyer's, what a, a seller's market it was. So nothing like the current situation we have today because the property is offered through HomePath. It's a foreclosure. It's only offered to owner occupants and not to investors for the first 30 days. And so that gives me a grace period to call up a couple of friends and investors and that kind of stuff and think about it. And I'll never forget one of the investors I met while networking in previous months decided to come through and walk through the property with me. That hour that that guy spent with me, just walking through the property to reassure me that, yeah, this is a good one. I would buy this in a heartbeat. I'll buy it if, if when it comes on the market. That little push over the edge I needed to fully commit to the action. So what did that look like? I, I made an offer for $240,000, which was like a little below asking price, I think two forty-five. dollars I put down 5% in an FHA loan, I which is $12,000, $12, closed a little bit later and got to work. First day I moved, I had a roommate at the time who was my, who, you know, was, is my best friend. And we had lived together since college. And so we were living in a apartment. He was a consultant and we moved in to the property that I think over Christmas or something like like that. It was miserable in the middle of the night. And I woke up the next morning and you realize very quickly when you don't have things like blinds in the bedroom and that kind of stuff, <laughs> because it's not a <laughs> right. furnished apartment, you know, with, with those types of things, it's habitable. So that weekend, I remember spending, running around to Home Depot, installing blinds and getting very basic stuff set up for the property, you know, with those types of things. Quickly, I got the other unit ready to rent. And then I and the roommate rented the other side and he paid me five fifty dollars per month. And the other side, Eleven fifty per month, and very quickly we kind of came to the arrangement, me and my my buddy, that he would buy another one later, and we would begin to pool the interests of the of the rental portfolio because it was a lot of debt and all that kind of stuff. So I started out the mortgage was fifteen fifty, that was principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and PMI, and getting seventeen hundred dollars a month in rent in total from the roommate in the in the other side. And then I did that for about eighteen months, and over that eighteen months, I you know had a bike and biked to work because um, the duplex was was within five miles of my my job and you know I was at bigger pockets I, I started out making like forty eight fifty thousand dollars a year and just kind of slowly snowballed my income as I started do, taking over ad sales for the company, for example. And maybe by 2016, my income had risen to 80,000 or so annually. And I had, you know, I was I was spending very little on housing with that kind of, maybe just utilities and maintenance and that kind of stuff. Uh, the property had gotten all, all rented out and was doing pretty nice and slowly appreciating and more rapidly appreciating in later years. And around 2016, March, we, d we decided, me and my, my roommate and buddy, to buy another property. And so that one, 
he purchased and we moved in and did the exact same thing, fixed it up, got it all ready and lived in the basement. This is an up-down duplex, we rented out the upstairs for I think 1500 on that one. This second duplex was much worse in the cash flow perspective than the first one, but it was in a much better location and it appreciated considerably more since 2016, uh, right on the edge of a trail um, and all that kind of good stuff. And so lived there for three years or four years and moved out in 2020. Uh, actually, what, what actually what happened there was after a couple of years, I moved out of the basement with my roommate and moved up into the upstairs with my then fiance and girlfriend and lived there for a year or two while we bought a third property. This one we pulled together as a partnership, which was a quadplex in 2019 in Denver, Colorado, and then held on to that. And then in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, finally moved out and stopped house hacking after a run of six or seven years between those couple of properties. And between them, I think they probably, I think the purchase prices were 240 and 360. And I wouldn't be surprised if the combined value is over a million dollars for those two properties at this point. Then plus the, you know, a couple of other investments that have been made over over that period. So I kind of glossed over a couple of things there, but is that a good high level overview of the, the house hacking career? Absolutely. I, I have a few questions. I wanted to circle back to uh, the first one where you did a 5% down FHA. You know, I hear a lot like I've done a three and a half percent down. Um, people always, you know, talk about the three and a half percent down. Was there a reason that you went with five percent down? I think I either was not aware of or not sophisticated. Like at the time here, there's no way I could say I'm pioneering any of this stuff, but the strategies were not as fleshed out as they are today, where it's like, here mm -hmm. is the optimal thing. The best option is the three and a half percent down conventional for these reasons and that. And so it just, I didn't have enough of the information with that. So I did what I thought was the best option, which was the 5% down FHA loan um, okay. at the time. So, but yeah, okay, cool. I, I probably could have in many cases optimized a few little things here and there around. Yeah. That. And I know you said that one cash flowed, which is pretty cool. When I look at duplexes and analyze those, I don't see a lot of uh, cash flowing duplexes when you're living in the property. Typically the ones I see, especially in my area, it's going to be like the ones that were built in like the early 1900s that are going to have like the best cash flow on paper. But then these are older houses that are kind of in downtown area. And, you know, once you actually factor in maintenance because of how old the house is, that cash flow looks just as good as the ones that were built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, kind of in the suburb area. But I, I don't see too many duplexes that cash flow these days. I don't know if you see any different in different markets. Yeah. So I'm under contract at this very moment on a duplex here in the Denver area. And the answer is no, they're not cash flowing the way that they used to. So you have to get a little mm -hmm. creative and change strategies. And so what I'm doing with this one is rent by the room. So it's a huge duplex and I'm buying it outside the city limits of Denver in a town called Lakewood, which allows rent by the room. It's got a ton of off-street parking, really nice units, really big units. Both have separate backyards that are grassy and perfect for dog owners, for example. And so, yeah, me, me and my buddy are going to turn that into a rent by the room property. We'll probably we'll buy it for seven twenty. We believe that with rent by the room, we can get income of about thirty-seven to thirty-eight hundred per unit with much higher turnover and higher management costs, but still dramatic improvement over the twenty-two hundred we get on a long-term rental basis. And so over time, over the first couple of years, we'll manage that intensively for the rent by the room and continue that indefinitely or turn it into a long-term rental at if and when rents rents increase over the over the years with that. We think this is a really quality asset in a really good location that's going to be put to its highest and best use with this. And so doing about $50,000 in remodeling to make it suitable to that purpose and um, kind of a unique, another unique asset. Yeah. A lot of like, I'll see duplexes around here and it'll be like, if you're going to house hack them, you know, the cash flow well house hacking is usually like somewhere around like negative 300, 400. But I think like people should still consider consider duplexes um, if they got a family. Like I have, you know, a wife, stepdaughter, and like, we're not going to move into a single family or anything and rent by the room. We're going to stick to like side-by-side -side duplexes, keep it comfortable. And it's still like, you know, the cost to live in the city, we're paying less than half that. So it's still a great deal. And on that note, you said that you were house hacking with your girlfriend at the time in the duplex, and then you moved over to, was it a quadplex that you house hacked afterwards? No, no, sorry. Or the two house hacks were the one that I purchased, the one that my buddy purchased. And then we- okay. I bought a, a quadplex together while house hacking the second house hack. And so we kind of did it in a little weirder of a way with some of those things. Okay. Um, my wife, fiance, moved in. Fiance at the time, wife now, oh, fiance. Uh, moved okay. in, in around 2018, let's call it. Um, 
I, I could be wrong there. She might be mad at me. Um, in 2020, I moved out of the house hack and began renting um, as a tenant in a nicer place downtown because I thought that it's a, it was a great time in the midst of the pandemic to rent downtown. <laughs> um, and so I got a great deal there. And actually, um, so I'm buying other property while renting as a tenant um, with that. So one, one and that, that might be a good model here for some folks listening around house hacking is house hacking is about the best thing you can possibly do with your money, um, in my opinion, um, from an ROI perspective. Because you could put down so little, leverage so much, and still take on a less risky position than all of your homeowning and renting peers. Because you're on the trend of rising prices and inflation, you're not, not against it as a tenant is. And you are getting that huge amount of leverage in return in a way that is less risky, I think, than your homeowner peers, because you have at least the chance of getting rental income from your tenants. Even if mm-hmm. that if, even if that dries up one day, the, house, the homeowner is not expecting that and has no chance uh, to get that. So it's, I think that that's, that's a huge advantage. But what's up, everybody? Let's take a quick minute and talk about Rent Ready. Are you new to house hacking and wondering how you find tenants and collect rent, especially while trying to maintain professional boundaries in a shared living space? Rent Ready can help you manage your house hack setup. For less than $9 a month, you can do it all. Fill rooms quickly with sites like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist with a free professionally designed listing page. Find high quality tenants with TransUnion certified background checks, electronically send, signed, and store leases, and collect rent for the entire lease or set up month to month charges. For your tenants, they use Rent Ready's app to complete the application, sign their lease, and pay you rent. They can even submit maintenance requests from the app instead of knocking on your door. Even better, Rent Ready is unlimited, so you don't have to pay per unit or per tenant. Just one flat price, which puts more money in your pocket. And speaking of putting more money in your pocket, Rent Ready has given our listeners a discount to get 50% off any Rent Ready plan when you sign up using our special code SUCCESS at RentReady.com. That's R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com using code SUCCESS for 50% off any Rent Ready plan. All right, let's get back to the episode. I think that that's, that's a huge advantage. But you know, now that seven years have passed, my real estate investing has done well. I've been investing in stocks that entire time. I've written a couple of books and I joined a startup that skyrocketed. My wealth has greatly increased. And so getting a 200% return on 12 grand is no longer interesting. I would rather get a 15, 17, 18, 20% return on $200,000, for example. That is much more meaningful and worthwhile of, of an endeavor for me than attempting to double 12 thousand dollars. And so that, you know, on, on an annualized basis. So now house hacking isn't really a big lever in my financial position, which sounds very arrogant or whatever, but it is also a reality that I think, you know, you can look forward to one day with those types of things is house hacking is not end state. It is a means to that future state of crossing the the the, the bridge to, to FI. And then once you're FI, you design exactly the lifestyle that you want using that passive income. Yeah. It's a, it's a great tool for like any average person to just start building wealth, cutting out living expense early in the investing stage is just massive because what is it like 33% is the average that Americans spend on housing. Mm-hmm. So imagine, you know, if you're working for all your money and you start house hacking, 33% of the time that you're spending working is no longer going to housing anymore. Yeah. Which, I mean, think about if you if you house hack, pay off your car and then use travel rewards to cover most of your like airline travel or whatever, that's 50% of most Americans spending right there. So you're at 50% savings rate just between those three things. And that's going to just fast track you to wealth with that. And you do it a couple of times and 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 all that and, and, and your investments start flowing. Now, then you go creep up to 55, 60, 75, 80, 85, 90, and then that magical 100. And then as long as you just never allow yourself to get past that 100%, <laughs> you're spending more than 100% of your passive income, your lifestyle can creep forever from then, not that, you know, not that I spend that much, but like you, you have that option because passive, it's not active income. It's, it's your passive income that's covering your lifestyle. Have you ever read the book, uh, Life and Air? I have. Yeah. I'm listening to it right now. And one of the points that they really drill down is if you can eliminate your housing expense, you can have a lot of freedom. And the book kind of talks about a little bit different than like, I think what we believe in. It talks about paying off a house or paying for it in full and saving up for a few years to be able to do that. 
And, you know, it's like make that three, four year sacrifice to pay off a house where like what we do if we house hack is you probably only have to make like maybe a one or two year sacrifice, depending on your income to just save up for a down payment. And then you can buy a house where you house hack and you can start living rent free, kind of like what Life in Air talks about much faster and is going to give you an asset too that's going to cash flow when you move out. So it turns that into just like a snowball effect that's going to grow your wealth and even get you more freedom than if you were just going to buy a house outright to eliminate mortgage payments. I love that book. I've read it. I internalized it. I don't do it. <laughs> I still have debt <laughs> right. on my assets and that kind of stuff. But that's because I kind of look at it as like, I'm here and I have the privilege of being able to run this company, Bigger Pockets. And I got no intention of stopping anytime soon because we got a mission and we're on it and we're, we're running towards it. And as a result of that, I have a, a very reliable stream of income coming from my income here and, and my books and, and my other assets. So I'm still in accumulation mode, even though I'm far past FI um, with that. If my circumstances were to change, I would quickly begin changing the state of my portfolio and beginning to deleverage or create more more true cash flow rather than you know kind of optimize for long term wealth. To a certain, to, for, you know because there's a difference, right? A leveraged portfolio is going to generate more long term wealth on average than a deleveraged one, but you're going to get more cash flow from a deleveraged one because you have less mm -hmm. debt, right? And so that's the the trade off there. And so I I'm kind of still going in the, the accumulation or building mode here with this. But you know, it's not because I have a desire to spend greatly. It's because it's a mathematical game and I can't help but play it, at least while my circumstances <laughs> say that's where it is. You know, there's no reason to have less money in 10 years if I'm going to work anyways right now than to, than to not, you know, so, so I, I'm just continuing to optimize. But if in the, in the end state, you know, if I want to spend a few years with future kids or whatever, I would absolutely adopt the principles of that book for the most part. Beware if you're listening. There are a lot of Christian principles in that book. That's fine with me. I'm, I was raised Catholic with all that, but uh, not be for, for some folks. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, and the my main takeaways have just been like trying to live a more abundant life, right? Like the end goal is figuring out how you can get to a point where you get to do the things that you enjoy, spend more time with family, whatever it is that your definition of an abundant life is. Whether you want to do it the way that the Life in Air book suggests and pay off a whole house, that's fine if that's your comfort level. But I feel and you probably feel that house hacking is probably the best way to get to that point of living a abundant life. Absolutely. And then you can eventually graduate from house hacking like, like you did. Yeah. And you just have to think of it as a means to an end, not the end state itself. So although it is the end state for a couple of people, we had Vicki Robin on the, uh, she, wrote, she wrote Your Money or Your Life, which is a very oh, yeah. or Another great book, one. And, and kind of pioneered a lot of this stuff 30 years ago before it was cool. But she house hacks currently, Vicki Robin house hacks currently with a, with a triplex that she rents out the other two units. And that's how um, she's able to, to to generate a lot of income to supplement her lifestyle and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it can be an end state um, as well. Yeah. And I believe uh, Brandon Turner is still house hacking in Hawaii. Is that correct? You know, I suppose, I suppose you could call what he's doing house hacking. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I remember hearing. Very good situation. Yeah, I think that is. I think it is house hacking. Yes. So, you know, after house hacking, you, you talked about how you acquired that quadplex. And then how did things kind of like move forward from there? Did everything kind of snowball and start to move faster for you? Were you able to do more and more deals? No, no. So I, I would say, I guess I'm a little unusual, maybe not unusual, but I'm a little different minded maybe than many of the folks who are super serious about real estate, where I kind of just have a slow and steady approach where I'm, gonna, I'm trying to buy one every two, one to two years or so, and just repeat that, sustain that over the course of 30 years with gradually larger investments mm -hmm. um, as my financial position improves. So I own four, I own three structures right now under contract on the fourth, it's like they'll close next week. We're recording this in early July. And I've also invested in syndications. I invest a tremendous amount in index funds. And when I have the opportunity with excess cash, I deposit as much as I can into a company called Bigger Pockets as an investor, um, because I like to, you know, I, I get, I have a chance to bet on myself and, and the company yeah. here with that. So most of my wealth, I would say more, half at least is in bigger pockets, perhaps closer to three quarters, perhaps depending on how you would, would, would value the business much more, eight, eight, eighty percent Then I have my real estate portfolio. Then I have my stock portfolio with that. And so I am not a big serial real estate investor the way that many of your, your, your listeners might be. I'm more of a kind of slow and steady, regular investor type. Okay, cool. That's, you know, kind of the cool thing. I talk about this a lot with house hacking or just real estate in general is like, it can allow you to, if you want to start a business or, you know, if you want to 
run a business because you're the third employee and you're going to help it grow. It kind of gives you that freedom to be able to do those things. Um, it, it enables risk. Like it allows you, if you're going to cut out your housing, it allows you to take on risk to, uh, you know, start a local business, start an online business, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be hundred percent real estate. It's just a kind of a small sacrifice, you know, to be able to do so much. Yeah. I think it's the gateway to getting the other side of fire, becoming financially free in three years or 15 years, if you choose not to use this tool, right? It's, it's, I think it's literally that difference because it's, it's such a powerful propellant, I guess, over the other side. I, I can't think of much besides building a successful business that could be faster. And there's a dramatic difference in difficulty between house hacking and building a successful business that, you know, is going to require a tremendous amount of risk or or, or knowledge or skill or whatever that is. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's just, I'm so glad you have the show and continuing to spread the good word of house hacking with the mission that I'm on with Bigger Pockets is how do you free up young people in particular, but high potential people early in life from dependence on wage income, because that's when they're going to go realize their potential and do something cool that's probably going to positively impact society. And so this is the path, right? If you can get the, the more house hacking that occurs, the more people that will go on to achieve that in their 20s and 30s. And and that's when you have really interesting downstream effects that trickle through. Yeah. Since you house hacked with your fiance at one point, do you have any advice to anyone who is trying to convince their significant other that it's a good idea to house hack? Well, I was house hacking before I met my wife. It was, you want to move in? No? Okay. <laughs> 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 or do you want to move? Yeah. Okay, great. Let's do it. <laughs> um, we'll do it here. So <laughs> uh, I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't really like that much of a discussion there. I don't think she, she didn't mind the place, but she was not sorry to leave <laughs> Yeah, uh, when we moved into the nicer place. So you can tell now we're married and we don't live there anymore and we live in a nice <laughs> place that we rent. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what, what the advice is there. The advice is start house hacking as early as you can so that the rest of your life can be spent either house hacking in a nicer location or in, you know, or, or designing the exact lifestyle that you want. Yeah, yeah, the advice right, is uh, not helpful there. <laughs> so start house hacking before you meet someone, and then uh, <laughs> then they have to house hack. That's that's exactly what happened to me too. Uh, like when I met my wife, now I was just about to buy duplex and moved into it. So when it came time to move in together, it was the obvious choice to move into the duplex and house hack. And now I just had to I had to do a little bit of convincing that we need to do a few more for the next five years, and then. Uh, then maybe move on to that single family house, but same situation. She was on board. Yep. So uh, let, let's talk about you know the current real estate market and what you're seeing. Do you have any predictions at all? I predict that in 30 years, real estate in Denver is going to be more valuable than it is today in terms of, uh, uh, at least nominally in terms of dollars. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's the simplistic <laughs> answer. So, but seriously, that's, that's how I frame all of my investing strategy mm -hmm. around that premise. I believe that long-term investment in a, a market that is desirable in, it, in its inherent characteristics, I, like Denver, people are moving to Denver because they want to live in Denver. Companies mm -hmm. are moving to Denver because people want to live in Denver because we've got cool stuff here. We've got mountains. We've got Rocky Mountain National Park an hour and a half away. We've got ski resorts. We've got incredible summer weather that is high and dry and beautiful summer nights and beautiful winter days and all that kind of stuff. And it's not... California or New York, there's an active scene here with the healthiest state, you know, um, or, or very close to it. And we've got limitations on supply. We've got plenty of land. Uh, it's a big flat land east of the, the mountains, but there's no water. So to get pump more water to support larger population here is incredibly expensive. You got to pump it in from the Midwest with that over hundreds and hundreds of miles. So it, there's a clear limitation on supply here in Colorado and a huge demand to live here just because it's awesome. And so to me, that bodes well for a 30-year timeline and says that I can't model it out. I can't give you any hard detail, but I can speculate that over 30 years, property here in Denver is going to appreciate faster than the national average over the long run. And so borrowing on a fixed rate rate against that long-term appreciation and sustaining at least a minimum amount of cash flow seems to me like a great way to drive consistent, great long-term returns. And so what is going to happen next year or in three years or in five years? I don't know. But a steady strategy of buying consistently over a 30-year period to me seems like a winning formula that I can apply and rest my head easy at night as long as I capitalize my business so that I won't go bankrupt in the interim. Because you know, if you go bankrupt, it ruins your whole plan right away. That's the plan is it's consistent conservatively continue to buy real estate in great locations in Denver, Colorado that meet minimum cash flow uh, uh, conditions 
and hold and wait. And so that seems to have been working very well so far. Maybe I've had just had a good run here, but I think that in the event of inflation, um, that could be likely to continue. Because you asked, I'll still speculate anyways in the next two to one, two, three, five years. I think if the government were not a factor, you could have a much better chance at predicting what is going to happen in the real estate market. But because the what is going to happen in the real estate market is the combination of economic and government uh, intersection with that, I think it's incredibly hard to predict what specifically is going to happen. For example, last year, prices should have come crashing down. But instead, we injected trillions of dollars into the economy and funded landlords through unemployment insurance. With unemployment insurance, we were making sure that uh, the lowest income earners, who are predominantly renters, had funds with which to pay rent for the most part. So you still hear stories about t- landlords that are not, that are struggling or whatever with tenants paying rent. But overwhelmingly, it's a remarkably positive story in the sense that there really wasn't a lot of uh, overall eviction as a percentage rate. Rent, rent collections were largely on time and in the full amount across the country, and especially for small mom and pop landlords compared to apartment co- complex owners. So what I think is going to happen over the next year or two, I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of inflation as a result of government fiscal policy and that that and artificially low interest rates that are going to continue to push prices high. I think you've got a complete lack of labor for in the construction industry. So that's going to limit supply. You've got raw material shortages right now which are increasing prices, at least temporarily, and may continue for some time. So I don't see where the supply of new housing stock is going to come from that's going to offset the demand that's going on going on here. I do think you're going to see a little bit of a rebound in apartments because living in an apartment in downtown cities is pretty cool in spite of the pandemic that we just had. <laughs> uh, so I think that now, now may be a good time for those types of condos or apartments there because they're probably a little bit compressed still. But I, I think that in general, I don't know if it's going to continue to inflate at 10% or 12% a year nationwide, the housing prices, but I think that they're going to continue to increase over time with that. You've also got a huge transfer of wealth coming from the older generation to millennials and the next generation, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are happening in several hundred thousand dollar installments. And that can go to housing and other types of things there. So I don't see where the where the prices are going to drop in the next year or two from a economic perspective. The government could change all of that in the stroke of a pen. So if you increase interest rates, you're going to immediately bring prices crashing down because when interest rates go up, your purchasing power declines because you can't afford the payment with those types of things. So that's a huge challenge there. If the government constricts the money supply and stops injecting trillions of dollars into the economy, I think you're going to see a recession or depression with with those types of things that comes about as a result of that. You know, um, if they continue doing that, you're going to see wild inflation. I don't mm-hmm. know what's more harmful. Inflation generates incredible amounts of wealth inequality because you know you're you're with with last year you're injecting all this unemployment insurance into the hands of renters that's flowing right on through to landlords and while you're reducing interest rates and doing that the prices of these properties increase by hundreds of thousands of dollars so scott as the landlord does not receive any unemployment insurance or stimulus check but instead i get hundreds of thousands of dollars of wealth appreciation for my rental properties as a result of government policy so you know i, I don't know what there's a right or wrong with any of these different types of things what i think is going to happen i think we're going to see inflation and the government continue to inject money into society and that continuing to bode well for the scarcest asset, which is real estate. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see too. Cause it's like, you know, my belief or perspective has always been like, if we're due for a recession and it's going to be coming and we just get out the money printers and send money into the economy to push off that recession, I feel like we're just delaying the inevitable and, you know, possibly making the impact larger when the money stops coming, you know, whether that's going to happen or not, we have no way of knowing, but I think it'll be interesting to see. I was curious too, while you were talking about Denver, I was doing some some quick Google searches of uh, Denver compared to Grand Rapids. Because from my perspective, Grand Rapids has been growing a lot. I see construction all over the place, uh, apartment complexes popping up all the time. But I'm looking at like the population increase from 2011 to 2019, and it's showing just a 10,000 increase. And then I look at Denver for that same uh, time span, and it's like 115,000, like significantly higher. And it's showing a pretty steep incline and population increase over the last 10 years. I think Grand Rapids is is probably a wonderful place. I I never visited, but I've been, you know, I've been to Michigan a few times with it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you don't, you think people are moving to Grand Rapids because it's, it's a nice place and it's, it's, it's affordable and there's a couple of good things there, but like Denver is freaking awesome. And people all over the country want to come here specifically of all the places in the country that they can choose to live. 
live. They want to be right here because of their, they love the outdoors or mountains or biking or hiking or whatever with that. And I'm sure that's that appeal. There's a appeal, similar appeal in some cases to places like Grand Rapids, but I think you've got Denver, Colorado, Nashville, Tennessee, Austin, Texas, Charlotte, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and maybe five, 10 other markets around the country that people are moving to just because they want to be there. And there's something, there's something about those cities that people are, are migrating to for, for various reasons with that. I don't know about those other cities in a 30 year time horizon, but you know, right now it seems like those are the places that have a lot of momentum. Yeah. Uh, with how good things have been in Denver, have you considered investing out of a state or are you just going to stay focused on Denver because you're familiar with the area? Well, again, I think I think it comes down to that 30 year time horizon, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not a real estate entrepreneur and I'm not chasing the yield in any short term capacity. I'm investing for the long term. And my belief is that long term, the yields here are going to be greater than other cities on an average long term basis. Now, I think I'm probably losing to my friends in Phoenix in, in a general <laughs> sense. So that might that might have been a better market with that. But I, I don't think that, for example, I will be wealthier in 30 years by going to Chattanooga, not nothing wrong with Chattanooga um, or Memphis, nothing wrong with Memphis, but I, I don't think that in 30 years, I'll make more money by moving into those markets and managing out of state mm-hmm. than I will with Denver. And I also don't think I'll have more cash flow in five, 10 years in those markets than I will in Denver because rent appreciation is a thing as well that we're experiencing here with it. Yeah, of course. From my side too, I, so I just listed a unit in the duplex that I'm in and I listed it yesterday and I've had about 75 or so messages of people interested. And I don't know, you know, I haven't paid very close attention up until now, but it seems like rent demand is really high. It could be something to do with the time of the year. That's another thing. I think rent prices are going to increase a ton this year. I think it's hard to buy homes right now and rent demand com- is going to follow that. And so I, I think it has not caught up yet, but I think that this next 12 months, months, you're going to see skyrocketing rent prices around the country. Last month or the month before, Denver rents increased 2% in a month, which is like a 25 or 30% CAGR when you multiply that out on a monthly basis over the course of a few, you know, 1.02 times 1.02 times 1.02, not, you know, kind of thing. So you've got it. That was an astronomical increase. And I think you're definitely going to see that in the next year, or that would be my prediction, at least absent again, government intervention. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense to have a direct correlation between uh, rent prices and you know the current housing supply. Wages are skyrocketing. Wages right are now. going up. Yeah. There's so many, uh, I mean, there's people just companies all over the place, just advertising on billboards with signing bonuses, all this, just trying to get people in, you know, wages are going up. You see all these, uh, you know, $15 an hour jobs for uh, their low skill jobs. So that's going to go up. Right. So with that rent prices got to go up. So um, do you have any advice for someone who, let's say, you know, they just started house hacking or they're maybe going on to the second house hack, but they're looking to get into other investments kind of like you did? What advice would you give to them for getting started? How how should they go about finding, you know, their sort of investing niche if they're not going to go fully into real estate? So I'm going to answer this from a personal perspective because that's selfish and, and easiest. Uh, but when you, when you think about investing, you have to say, what is my why, my goal? And for me, that is financial freedom and long-term wealth, right? It's the combination of getting to the, over the hump and building a sustainable, self-perpetuating state that actually expands over time, because that's the conservative way to set yourself up for life with, with that. Okay, great. I have four levers I can pull. One is to spend less. One is to earn more. One is to invest accord- to attempt to build assets. And the, and the last is to create assets, right? And none of those levers is right or wrong. All of them are the right one at the right time. When you're earning $50,000 a year and have no assets and no wealth and work a full-time job, you can't create a business, can't really earn more income unless you're going to moonlight at $7 an hour on driving Uber or whatever, and you can't, you have nothing to invest. So therefore your lever is is saving money. (laughs) Once you have a few thousand dollars, maybe you can get into house hack, but when you're outside of your, when you're in that year window or waiting your year or whatever it is, or saving up, you don't have the option really to invest in a way that's going to meaningfully move your position forward. So then you have to get back to frugality and saving or whatever. When, and if you get a job that allows you to earn unlimited amounts of income, like for example, let's say you become a real estate agent or you start a business or you join a startup or whatever, then all your focus should be on that because that's your biggest lever in the the short run. You can relax a little bit on the spending side and not worry about the investing, maybe go more passive with that. When you have 50 grand and in liquidity and very little else with those assets, maybe that's the time to think about real estate investing because that's a great way to get that arbitrage return. So you have to 
use the right tool at the right moment in your journey with that. And then once you get to closer to five, maybe cross that $250,000, $500,000 mark, and you've got a a thousand or so in passive income, a little bit of liquidity, maybe that's the time to start thinking about creating assets and leaving your job if the upside isn't there and those kinds of things. So you have to use the right tool at the right moment. When it comes to that hard decision in the first house hack or something, let's say you're at a little under $100,000 in net worth, um, you're grinding it out, you're steadily improving with that kind of stuff. Well, you have to make choices at that point, right? Like the perfect state is, okay, I'm going to max out, I'm going to hit my Roth, my 401k match at work, then I'm going to max out my Roth, then I'm going to save up for the house hack, then I'm going to invest in stocks. You can't do it all because you don't have enough cash flow to do all the things you want to do. So at, at least at first, you have to concentrate your resources and you're, you have to focus and not diversify. Diversification under $100,000 in net worth guarantees you a slow path to FI. So it's scary as hell, but you have to do that at the very beginning of your journey. Uh, you have to concentrate and focus and, and double down on what's working. And then once you begin crossing the several hundred thousand dollar net worth mark and marching toward a million, that's when it begins to make more sense to begin diversifying and that kind of stuff if you want to be you know stable with your financial position. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that answers maybe the higher level question that would that would kind of give someone a framework to go and begin making choices there. You hit a point that uh, Bradley, our co-host, likes to talk about a lot is uh, that singular focus in the beginning. And that's something that's been huge for him because he started off with a 203k loan where he rehabbed a uh, triplex, turned it into a quadplex, got a lot of cash flow out of that and did another house hack, another deal. But because of those deals that he did, he got the freedom to be able to, he's going to start his own brokerage. Now he's starting a construction company and he's not taking on a lot of risk because of that. But um, in the first few years, the singular focus was house hacking. Yeah. So he probably concentrated 95% of his net worth into real estate at that point in time. When I first started out, my net worth was $20,000 in cash, then $240,000 in real estate with the 235 or whatever thousand dollar loan after the closing fees. And three and eight thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars in cash and that's it right there's no there's no diversification when you're starting out you have to concentrate and go singularly focus like uh, your co-host on that one most important thing or one or two most important things. And then you can build up the several sources of income steadily over time. It's super uncomfortable and it has to be. There's just no other, unless you want to just grind it out for 10, 15 years to build out the diversified portfolio at 8% compounding returns that's less risky. All right. Well, Scott, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Before we uh, end the call, we got a couple just quick closing questions. This is a good opportunity to uh, talk about the books you wrote, but do you have a favorite uh, real estate or business book? So I'm going to I give you two personal finance books. One is is going to be The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And the second is going to be The Millionaire Next Door. And I intentionally do not plug the Bigger Pockets books because they're all Bigger Pockets books and that would be shameless. But I love all of those. Uh, but I will not. The two books that I recommend are going to be those two. I'm not affiliated, just fan. Awesome. Just fan. Awesome. And what's the difference between the person who's going to take action and move forward with house hacking versus someone who's nervous about getting started? Maybe the person who is taking action can't articulate it this way, but this is what is happening. Happening. They're saying the risk of losing or having a problem with the house hack has to be weighed against the risk of not act of, of inaction and stagnation and loss and slow suck away of my human potential by not realizing all of that. And so they realize the difference between those two things is risks and, and act accordingly. And it's far riskier to not act and just allow your potential to waste away than to act and 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 seize and at least try. I love that. Yeah, there's definitely a big opportunity cost there. All right. Where can people find out more about you. You can find me on Bigger Pockets. Uh, you can search my name in the search bar and connect there, or you can uh, find me on Instagram at, at Scott underscore Trench. There's probably a couple other places. Oh, we have a, a Facebook group for Bigger Pockets money as well, um, in addition to our forums on Bigger Pockets. So I hang out there a lot. So yeah, those are those are a couple of good places. Awesome. For the listeners, uh, we'll put those links in the description. Uh, we're going to link to your books too. And really appreciate you coming on. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Drew. Yep. Thank you, Scott.